think it's really good, good where, where how we started off the meeting because Hossam really talks about the practice of social media inside of the Egyptian revolution and the social movement that, uh, prior to the Egyptian revolution that took place. And what I want to do in the second part of the meeting really is try to develop a theoretization of, of how we can understand social media, of how we can understand uh, uh, the, uh, the dialectic between revo uh, revolution and technology as well as the nature of the internet and effectively tap into some of the questions that Hossam raises at the very end in the, that relate to agitation and propaganda. Why did the general strike on February 11th and why did the agitation not, uh, not uh, bear fruit? Well, what kind of propaganda do we exactly, exactly need? And I think it's important because I think if we look around the mainstream media, what we see is we see, oh, Twitter is, you know, uh, Twitter calls the Arab Spring. I simply reject such a claim on the on a fundamental basis. But however, I think it doesn't mean that we need to reject Twitter, uh, Twitter as a whole. What I want to argue in the meeting, in particular, is that we can use social media, we can use uh, the internet. And the, sci and, and, and the cyberspace to, to build revolutionary organizations uh, and, and to complement our work that, uh, that Hossam outlined alongside our propaganda and our, our, our papers. Now what, I want, uh, now what I want to really speak, uh, talk about is I will refer to a number of Marxist thinkers uh, throughout, throughout the next 20 minutes. And once Tony Cliff said we, stand, uh, we can look further because we stand on the shoulders of giants. And I think that's really the, the crux of the meeting today because we want to look further than just falling into the, to the di kind of dichotomy that online networks in some way can replace real offline networks and revolutionary organization. <coughs> That's just uh, ludicrous. We also want to reject uh, the kind of dichotomy that, effecti uh, that effectively has, co has come about uh, that, uh, that came up in the students movement in 2010, that you didn't need any kind of organizations whatsoever and thought all you had to do is go onto Twitter, tweet a bit, have it, have it trending and everyone would come, uh, come into the street. But however, there is a, a, a relationship between technology and revolution that I want to explore. And namely, it starts in 1848. The message of the, uh, uh, the, message of the 1848 revolution took only six days to reach from Paris to Milan. In 1789, the, storm, uh, the message of the storming of the Bastille had taken exactly 13 days uh, to, to, reach, uh, to, reach, uh, to reach Milan. And those changes that happen in, the, in the, what Marx calls the base ultimately have to reflect also in how we as revolutionary socialists and socialists uh, uh, adapt to the objective cir circumstances. And much like the 19th century, in which there was massive in the industrialization, today the Arab world is, uh, as Hossam has outlined, uh, goes hand in hand as that as well. Today we fast forward 2011, and effectively we're watching the Egyptian revolution unfold li in live stream. We see how Simon Assaf posts videos that no one would otherwise find about, about the Syrian revolution. We see how Alex Kalinikos gives an analysis of the Eurozone in, t in 200 words on, on, on Facebook. But what does that ultimately mean? Ultimately, the, the reason why 1848 and even the Egyptian 2011 is so fundamental isn't because the fact that suddenly we have these technologies at our disposal. No, 1848 was crucial in the sense that for the first time communists and socialists gained influence and changed the balance of forces inside, inside, of, those inside of those revolutions. And so today we need to understand in how far technologies can facilitate, uh, can facilitate that uh, that. To, uh, challenge of forces. So we can't fall into either the kind of cyber utopianism that you see on the one hand, which says, well, the internet will be the basis of human liberation for all, and all we have to do is use the internet, etc., that effectively can change everything. And at the same time, we can't fall into the cyber dystopianism as people like Mozorov and others have, have painted a very bleak picture of the world. Because as Marxists, as dialectical materialists, we understand the role of technology in a very different, in a different way. Marx was very clear that innovation and technology were not the engines of history, but effectively the emancipation of the working class as the act of the working class itself was the, was the engine of history. And what he, was, what he understood was that he wasn't scared of new technologies. He wasn't scared and he, gra and he grasped their potentialities. The kind of 
productive forces that capitalism unleashes are barbaric and at the same time they have m immense potentials to facilitate and to even lay the basis for human liberation and socialism. And what Frederick Jameson writes in uh, his book Postmodernism or the Late Logic of Capitalism is the following. In a well-known passage, Marx powerfully urges us to do the impossible, namely to think this development, the historical development of capitalism, positively and negatively all at once. We are somehow to lift our minds to a point at which it is possible to understand that capitalism is at one and the same time the best thing uh, that has ever happened to the human race and the, and, and the worst. And that's really the, the dialectic that, that we, we need to understand today when we're talking about social media and capitalism. Because at the same time, while it has empowered Egyptian revolutionaries, it has empowered the youth in Bahrain, it has empowered students who stormed Milbank, at the same time, it, ha it alienates. It, it actually disempowers at the, at, at, the same, at the same time. And what Walter Benjamin wrote was that the scars of the suffering that was part and, par uh, that, uh, that was part and parcel of it also kind of have the promise of, hu of human liberation in, in, in its way. So how did, how did uh, the Bolsheviks try to grapple with new technological uh, in innovations? Effectively, at the time after the Civil War, the, the Russian film market was flooded with American Hollywood movies, and Lenin had a task at hand. How was he going to stop American movies from flooding in? Similar to the situation that we have the dominance of Google, we have the dominance of Facebook, we have the dominance of all these different eBay and whatever they're called. And effectively, how did he try to grapple with, uh, with the problem? Because they didn't have the necessary resources to compete uh, with uh, with, the, uh, with the American movies. It wasn't that Lenin simply rejected cinema because American movies, uh, American movies flooded the market. What he said was, cinema is the most important art for us all. And what he did, gave was Vertov and Eisenstein and people like that the task to transpose the lessons of, of agitation and propaganda that, we, that they had learned from Plekhanov and that Lenin carried forward in what is to be done and transpose them onto the field of media trying to unite form uh, and content in the very, in the very art it, it, uh, of cinema it, itself. And, that, and that's why I believe that today, as revolutionary socialists, uh, we have to grasp the potentiality of social media. So I don't want to even deal with uh, slacktivism as a form of, of, of online activism. Uh, but what I want to do is, is really go into of the everyday use that people use the internet in, that we use our, the internet in, in our trade unions, in, our, in, different, uh, in different movements, in the campaigns that we run, ultimately has enriched some of the campaigns that we have run over, over the past, and also can, uh, can provide a basis to understand in what ways we have to move forward in terms of theorizing the kind of problems we need to address in our practical agitation. Uh, and, 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 in, and our propaganda, because if we look at what we do, oftentimes we set up a stall at our university, or we hold a, or we hold a branch meeting in our, in our trade union, and at the same time we use an online petition. The use of online petitions, everyone has set up an online petition in, in, the, in, the, way that, uh, in the way that effectively has tried to, has tried to gather people uh, around them. The problem, though, however, has, has been with the online petitions. And if you look at the, at the disunity of form and content, is that at many times we haven't been able uh, and you aren't able to retrieve the kind of addresses that you would collect on a socialist worker stall with the kind, with the kind of petitions that you get online. In most in the, in the case, in one very good case, after Millbank, we had a normal petition. Uh, that we were going around with through the colleges and through the university, and on the other hand, we had an online petition in which uh, Noam Chomsky signed up. I still don't have his email address, <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, which etc. And I think that really means uh, that really means that we need to start to think about how revolutionaries can start to grasp not only 
user-generated content, but also start to think about how can we come to terms with the kind of form that can drive and accelerate the kind of contradictions inside of the system as a whole. And that relates to one thing. There's a diet, as, and Hossam pointed that out very well and very implicitly, but it's, an it's one of the crucial points, that there's ultimately a dialectical relationship between online and, uh, online and offline political action. And in many ways, that kind, of, uh, that kind of relationship also reflects the relationship that Hossam described between the mainstream media and, the so and, and social media, and that Johnny Jones lays out in his article uh, in a few eyes days ago uh, very, very, uh, very, very well. However, we often think about producing online and having online political activities as simply about putting up an article or just putting up theory, and that happens online and that the practice effectively happens offline in some way. But as I mentioned with the example of the petition, and that's what I think we need to come to terms with, is effectively that by setting up a petition offline, by setting up a Facebook group uh, online, I mean by setting up a Facebook group online, you're trying to cope with the problem of how do we replace structures, how do we come to terms with structures uh, that, that don't, don't exist on the ground and effectively cr try to create offline uh, and, and feed it into our offline revolutionary activity and in order to help us with revolutionary activity uh, on, 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 the, on the ground. So well, what, what, should we, what, should we effectively, what should we effectively do and how can we as Leninists Understanding that the CIA, understanding that the Labour Party, the Democratic Party and Obama and all these various different political actors and social forces and social classes in society are changing the way that they use and the way that they conceive of the internet. What do we as Leninists have to do, that have to do, different, have to do differently? And the thing is, the starting point for it is really is the, is the student movement for me because the student movement showed that stu FE students who, uh, many of them who were in the SWP at the time, set, didn't have any political structures in their, in their sixth form colleges or in, their, in, or in their schools, and effectively set up Facebook groups and Facebook events in order to mobilize, in order to mobilize for uh, the student walkouts. And in, so far, it did, actually, it, did actually, it did actually work. But how do we actually come to terms with the different social media that we have uh, that we have at our disposal, uh, to, uh, at our disposal today, and turn an audience, which is ma mainly passive rather than interactive, into producers uh, in, of revolutionary politics. Into how do we turn them into members of of the S SWP? And I said that at the Gigi Ibrahim meeting yesterday evening. It make, uh, and I will name a few examples about it. It isn't simply enough to. It isn't simply enough to put up a video, uh, a video of myself giving a 30-minute speech on uh, police brutality in order to highlight all the contradictions inside of the capitalist system on why the police, uh, on why the police protects uh, the 1%. Ultimately, the Ian Tomlinson video of five seconds <coughs> did what I didn't succeed in doing in a 30-minute speech. And what we need to be thinking about is we cannot simply leave it to the Guardian to expose those modern-day Contradictions. We cannot simply leave it to the liberals, but ultimately we we need to cut right uh, we need to cut right right through that in order in order to turn an audience into into active participants. And what I, and I'll take an example from theater and from Brecht that effectively highlights and how we can absorb different mark, uh, the rich Marxist tradition in terms of coming to terms with the kind of interpassivity problem, the kind of problems. Of, of, of the audience in terms of seeing where we want to go, where we want to go, uh, where we want to go next, because uh, where we want to go. I don't have much time to go into it, but we can uh, talk about it later on. What I wanted to really uh, go into is something around agitation and, and, and propaganda. And we have a very rich tradition, and people should go back and read Duncan Hallis, Agitation and Propaganda, Chris Harmon, The Revolutionary Press, uh, and, and Lenin, what is, uh, what is to be done and the, and the reason of why he speaks and why he sees the necessity for an all-Russian uh, all newspaper. And Duncan Hallis writes in Agitation and Propaganda, and this relates to a problem that the Egyptian comrades faced very much, we are talking to small numbers of people rather than on the basis of mass agitation. So what we are arguing is basically propaganda, but it's here that confusion arises. 
Because there is more than one sort of propaganda, there is a distinction between abstract propaganda and that propaganda which can hopefully lead to activity, concrete, realistic propaganda. So in order to come to terms with the problem, sometimes, of course, it is much more uh, valuable to you know, sit down with your neighbor, sit down with your fellow college or university student, and really have an intense political relationship with those people, rather than you know, try to activate uh, someone 100 million miles uh, 100 mi million miles uh, away, and the thing, uh, but the th but the thing is that there's that we can start to raise concrete, realistic uh, propaganda inside of the social networks, inside, uh, 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 yeah, inside inside of the social networks, and uh, and in the internet, because the internet ultimately, and this is what our comrade Miriam Arwak uh, uh, writes about in Online Palestine. Uh, one of the books that he just has recently written, is that effectively the internet is like a city. In the same way that the city is neoliberal, the, the internet, of course, is dominated by the logic of capital accumulation, of capital production. But at the same time, there's a, also a space for resistance to capital. Whilst you have you know, billboards, advertising, crap that we don't want to buy, but then suddenly find ourselves buying, and at the same time, you'll have revolutionary graffitis, you'll have you know, the pamphleteer, pamphleteers, you'll have the public squares, etc. That's what we need to conceive the internet of. It hasn't replaced the public squares, but they stand in a relationship to, enough, in, to one another. In the same way that we have seen uh, that we test things in practice, offline in the same way that we, uh, we try to agitate amongst workers where the workers and the masses are found. We also have to do that on, on, an, on, on, an, on, online, uh, online, on an online basis. And the distinction there is really crucial between uh, <coughs> networks as space and online networks as spaces of dissent and as, as tools. And in the same sense that actually what really has become clear is that and on November 30th, for example, when uh, 2.6 million workers went out on strike, what you saw was that picture, uh, people uploaded pictures from their picket line, from their strikes, and started discussing underneath those pictures, really, what is the way forward for the strike, what is going to happen next, how are we going to intervene, etc. And what people really started to try to do is try to distill the kind of uh, experience and try to to, uh, to put forward uh, their their arguments about what was happening uh, on the on the day itself. The second one is is using, as I outlined before, like the FE students did, uh, Facebook, Twitter, etc., as 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 as, to, as tools. And what we understand is that Facebook, of course, cannot replace the or Twitter cannot replace the newspaper. Uh, as, as the tool, and the newspaper re remains the first and foremost tool of any revolutionary or organization in order to overcome the unevenness in class consciousness, in order to or act as the organizer, and also to act as the kind of authority that simply cannot be established in online, where you have little bits and pieces of information, and where you have a disunity of form, a form and content that I spoke <coughs> spoke before. And I need to and I need to sum up. But there's one last point that Chris Harmon mentions in the Revolutionary Press, which is important. That he speaks about a process of distillation, which is need, is still needed to separate all the new ideas off from the old ideas, which are still mixed. In, work, in workers' consciousness. And Chris Harmon ends that, uh, ends that paragraph on saying that process of distillation is not, uh, is not that difficult. And that is why the most successful papers have always been those produced in upturns of the struggle. Now people are producing and are putting online photos, they're putting up their videos, they're putting up little comments and are even expected to, to comment. And what we effectively have to understand as revolutionaries is how we in integrate that into our overall mode of generating, of, of agitating, of producing, of pr producing propaganda, and also building upon the self-activity of the working class itself. Zinoviev, very, not very popular, once called that the communist reporters, but even the IS in the late 1960s and 70s had the idea in order to deeper implement, implant ourselves inside of the working class movement, we had to have industrial 
uh, industrial corris uh, correspondence. And I think that idea is a very valuable one in order to understand what we can, uh, what we can do today. In order to build for a revolutionary party, those things, are very, those things are very crucial at this moment in time and to order un understand. And this is a very, really rough draft of like what, you know, and a work in progress. But I think it can lay a basis from which we can have a real discussion for the kind of, uh, for the kind of needs that the Revolutionary Party needs to face today and, and successfully, and successfully develop, uh, develop a, rich a rich Marxist tradition that has come to terms with many difficult questions before.